pause, one, two. Hey, welcome everyone. <laughs> Those of you who are joining out there virtually this morning, whether by video or by podcast, we really want to welcome you this morning to Columbine as we're having fun here. Whether we mess up or we're perfect, we love this place. I think you will find this sermon to be something you can apply to your life. Our scripture text this morning comes from Leviticus chapter 19, starting in verse 1. God spoke to Moses, speak to the congregation of Israel, tell them, be holy, because I, God, your God, am holy. Every one of you must respect his mother and father, keep my Sabbaths, I am God, your God. This is one thing I love about the scripture text, over and over again all morning, I get to say, I'm God, you're God, it's fun. It's really fun. <laughs> Every one of you must respect his mother and father. Keep my Sabbaths. I am God, your God. Don't take up with no God idols. Don't make gods of cast metal. I am God, your God. When you sacrifice a peace offering to God, do it as you've been taught so it is acceptable. Eat it on the day you sacrifice it and the day following. Whatever is left until the third day is to be burned up. If it isn't eaten on the third day, it is polluted meat and not acceptable. Whoever eats it will be held responsible because he has violated what is holy to God, and that person will be cut off from his people just for violating some uh, dietary laws. When you harvest your land, don't harvest right up to the edges of your field or gather the gleanings from the harvest. Don't strip your vineyard bare or go back and pick up the fallen grapes. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am God, your God. Don't steal, don't lie, don't deceive anyone. Don't swear falsely using my name, violating the name of your God. I am God. Don't exploit your friend or rob him. Don't hold back the wages of a hired hand overnight. Don't curse the deaf. Don't put a stumbling block in front of the blind. Fear your God. I am God. Don't pervert justice. Don't show favoritism to either the poor or the great. Judge on the basis of what is right. Don't spread gossip and rumors. Don't just stand by when your neighbor's life is in danger. I am God. Don't secretly hate your neighbor. If you have something against him, get it out into the open. Otherwise, you are an accomplice in his guilt. Don't seek revenge or carry a grudge against any of your people. Love your neighbor as yourself. I am God. And there our scripture text ends. Let's consider how we'll apply these words to our lives this morning. Question, are you evolving? Now, I, I see some of you wives out there just elbowed your husbands <laughs> for not being that evolved. And I, I fully understand that sentiment. I am not always the most evolved person in the world, but I may be evolving. And so this sermon fits into this whole sermon series that we've been doing called The Big Bang Reality. The idea that 13.8 billion years ago, God acted and moved, and the universe came into being, and God is still moving and working and acting in our lives in the same way, creating the same sort of Big Bang explosions in our lives. And Steve last week showed us that even the Ten Commandments were a Big Bang. And he went through and showed us that we are all made in the image of God, that we do not need any stone or wood idols because we, we are the very resemblance and symbol and image of God. And that we carry around God's name and thus we carry around God's power. And that power and that beauty and that image and that aura of the divine energy and presence of God is working through us all of the time. And when we really begin to look at these Ten Commandments, we see that it is God working in us. It's not just commands or rules or regulations. These are things that enable us to be God-like and to change our lives and to change the world. Well, today I want to deal with the other seven commandments that he did not deal with last week. And in order to do that, we jumped into this book of Leviticus. Okay? And Leviticus takes those ten rules and expands on them for chapters upon chapters on end. I think there's 27 chapters in Leviticus or something like that. And it goes on and expands these rules farther out and gets far, far more detailed with them. And the question I want you to think about this morning is, what's the next step in your journey? 
What's the next step in your life's journey, in your spiritual journey? What's the next stage you need to be aimed at in your faith stages? What's the next level of consciousness that you need to transcend into? What is the next place that you are going to go to and encounter? Where are you going with your life? Now, Leviticus is probably a strange place to go to answer those questions. I mean, first of all, how many of you have cracked open a Bible lately in general? Just asking, just asking, okay? You don't have to raise your hands, you know, we don't have to do that. But if you have cracked open a Bible lately, how many of you have cracked it open and purposely went to the book of Leviticus? I got one. I got one. I mean, it's not a book that we typically go to. In fact, when you do happen to run into it, you go, well, that's weird, and you move on. You either close your Bible altogether and go, that's what I thought was in there, or (laughs) you go, maybe I'll try something else out. Leviticus is not exactly the book that people in the contemporary world, like us, want to go to. It is old and weird and odd and so many different things. It does not relate to our world and our culture. It belongs in a world thousands of years ago. And so we avoid it at all costs for the most part. Now, Mitch had a great question that he asked me after the last service. He goes, what's Leviticus? Like, I know it's a book in the Bible. I mean, you know, I kind of looked at him like, you know, it's a book in the Bible, man. And he was like, no, I got that. But what is it? Is it a person's name? Is it a place? Is it a concept? Is it a thing? So I thought I would tell you all. So Leviticus comes from the first four letters, Levi. Okay? And Levi was a son of Jacob who became a tribe in the nation of Israel. And the Levites were the priestly tribe. They were the ones whose job was to care for God's law and to make sacrifices and to take care of the tabernacle and the temple and all those sort of things. They essentially were the ministers of the, uh, of the society of Israel. And so the book of Leviticus is a book about things pertaining to what they did. Make sense? Okay. So, let, just to illustrate how weird this book is, I uh, found some uh, comic things online. And this is a great example of some of the rules and regulations that are in the book of Leviticus. So here on the left, we got prisoner A who says, I cut my hair. That's why I'm in here. What are you in for? And the other person goes, well, I wore a poly cotton blend. That is a huge no-no in the book of Leviticus. So the vast majority of you out here today would have to be cast outside of our community for wearing a poly cotton blend. Uh-huh. And to be cast outside of the community was not just like, okay, you have to go over there in the corner. Okay? You were literally being cast outside of the village tribal circle, which meant that you were now vulnerable to thieves and robbers and murderers and marauders. When you were outside of the safety of the community, you were literally cut off, and most likely, there's a good chance that you would die. And so you would be cut off for wearing a poly cotton blend. Another great example of this is not only would people have to follow these laws, but they would know if you were following them or not. Based on, if you had messed up, you had to bring a sacrifice to the priest. Okay? And so here, another, another example. There goes Bill with a guilt offering. I wonder what he did. I think he touched a swarming thing. And most of you don't get the joke because you haven't read the book of Leviticus. <laughs> but all of these different animals and insects and fish and things are outlawed in the book of Leviticus. So, uh, for example, last summer when we did uh, Pride Sunday... And uh, Leviticus condemns uh, different things to do with our sexuality. It also condemns things like, um, oh yeah, eating shrimp. And so people literally have uh, t-shirts, those who are are fairly progressive and more liberal in their theology, have shirts that says, God hates shrimp. Okay? 
to say that maybe not everything in the Bible applies to today, okay? And so also swarming things like flies and various things like that were outlawed as well. And if you touched one of those things or one of those things bit you, once again, you were cut off. You had to go outside the village safety zone and uh, you had to complete your one week of purification. And if you lasted then you got to come back in and you got to be a nice, normal member of society. Good luck with that. So what do we do with this book and why am I even preaching on it today? This is a crazy book. It has all kinds of weird rules in it that we just go, those are antiquated. Those are repressive. Those are messed up. Well, if you didn't know, society's been developing for quite a long time. If you go back, all the way back here, you know, 2.5 million years ago is when our uh, homo sapien ancestors, maybe probably, probably before even homo sapiens, developed stone tools, okay? Imagine not having all of the conveniences that we have. Imagine someone develops stone tools and the advances in civilization that begin because of that. And then travel all the way down to, say, 50,000 years ago. And 50,000 years ago, there was a cultural revolution, which included ritualistic burials and clothing making and complicating hunting techniques. And that was a cultural revolution. We forget that history has been going on for a long time and that there was a point in history, when you go back, where there were not the things that make up what we call civilization, that there were not tools, that there were not clothes, that there were not all of the various things that make up our lives, which includes laws and regulations. There was a time where human society did not generally agree on that you should not murder, where murder was pretty typical. It was up for grabs. It wasn't a moral issue. Murdering was perfectly acceptable if that's what you had to do to get by in your daily life. There was a time when stealing was not only not wrong, it was the way to get through the world. And society and that culture and those tribes did not generally agree on that you should not do that. And eventually someone said, oh, I have a bright idea. What if we don't steal from one another? Maybe we'll all get along better. And then maybe I won't have to murder you. (laughs) Right? See how that works? I won't have to kill you if you don't steal something from me. And uh, maybe if you don't uh, covet after your neighbor's wife, then maybe I won't have to kill you for that either. Right? Right? And you can see how these commandments, the Ten Commandments and the book of Leviticus, begins to develop and how a society begins to develop. These laws created a more civilized way of living. It created order out of chaos. And so there was a point when this book of Leviticus was written where this was revolutionary, where this was freeing and open and increased society, and increased our lives. Now, thousands of years later, we come back to some of these laws, not really the ones we read today, a couple of them. But if you look at the whole book of Leviticus, and we read those laws, we go, wow, that's really bad. That's really repressive. It's very antiquated. And we forget that we have been developing since then. That that our ideas of God and ethics and morality and and spirituality have developed since then. But I think in these pages and in the scripture text we read today, there are concepts and ideas that apply to our lives and help us to develop, help us to increase, help us to expand and to evolve. And one of those concepts is be holy because your God is holy. Now, how many of you really like the word holy and holiness? Yeah, I didn't think so, yeah. Got one of you to say, I read Leviticus, but none of you were like, yeah, yeah, I love that word holy. I mean, right? That just makes us feel guilty. It makes us feel not good enough. 
The word holy, you're just like, ah. And depending on your particular background, the word holy may have been used a lot in your particular uh, religious tradition, and you go, I hate that word. Not only do I like, mm, I feel a little guilty about it, I hate that word. Because that is telling me that there's someone, and usually a whole group of people in a particular spiritual community who think that they're better than everybody else. Or that there's some legalistic way of living and that every aspect of my life has to be dictated by some religious authority. We hate this word, holy and holiness. It doesn't really work well for us. How about I use the word, though, sacred? You like the word sacred? Any of you like the word sacred? You know, some of you are like, yeah, okay. Sacred's a little bit better, right? How about happiness? You like happiness? Yeah, everyone's like, oh, I love happiness, right? Yeah. What about wholeness? You like wholeness? What about health? Healthy. The word holy comes from an old English word that literally means wholeness, healthiness, and happiness. To be holy is to be happy. To be holy means to be healthy. To be holy means to be whole and to have wholeness in your life. How many of you want to be happy? Right? Some of you did not raise your hands. <laughs> Miserable people. <laughs> I think most of us really do want to be happy and whole and healthy and to be holy really has to do with those things. We want that to be a part of our life. And here's the thing I know. When we are happy and healthy and holy, we evolve. We develop. We expand. We get to the next place and stage and steps in our life. And so when I read through the scripture text today, here are the concepts that I took out of Leviticus. First of all, it starts out with honor your father and mother and keep the Sabbath. Respect, rest, boundaries. These make us better human beings. We often do not do a good job of respecting ourselves, which is where Sabbath comes in. The idea of Sabbath is that there has to be a limit in my life to the amount of work that I do. There has to be a time where I step away and go, this is time for me. This is time for me and my family. This is time for me and my friends. This is time for me and nature. To say that there is a limit, and that makes us healthier and happier and more whole. Honoring and respecting the loved ones in our lives makes our lives better, makes their lives better, makes all of our communities and society better. And the only way we can honor and respect someone else is, first of all, we must honor and respect ourselves. If we are not living healthy habits inside of us and setting those proper boundaries and creating those good rhythms in our life, then you cannot honor someone else properly. You will not have the time nor the focus to be able to do that for them. The next part is the part that Steve uh, mentioned and talked about in his sermon last week. This idea of idolatry and in Latin, the imago Dei, the image of God. When we say that the image of God is out there, rather than inside of us, we denigrate ourselves. We denigrate all of, human, all, all of humanity. When we see that I am the image of God and you are the image of God, then I can have that proper respect for myself. And I can have that proper respect for all of the other human beings I encounter every day. The book of Leviticus is obsessed with dietary laws and sexual laws and things governing where people are supposed to put their sewage or where people are supposed to do the business. Why? Because God is concerned about our health. God is concerned about our bodies and what we do in them and to them and with them and through them. 
we are a culture that seemingly seems to be obsessed with hell. Although most of us do a great job of thinking and worrying about it more than we do actually enacting it, right? We all want to be healthy, desperately want to be healthy. But most of us don't actually do anything in our lives to regulate ourselves to make sure that we do have healthy habits for our bodies and with our bodies and what we do with our bodies to other people and with other people. And so what are we going to do about that? And here's the thing I know. When, when I meet someone who, whether they're 30 or whether they're 80, who changes their dietary habits and changes their exercise, there's a new vitality in them, a new amount of energy. And that energy brings creativity. And it brings focus. It brings an expansion of who they are. And they literally take up more space in the world because that goodness and that wholeness is flowing out of them and their influence is immense it's amazing in fact Leviticus tells us that we must be good to creation we must be good to the environment we must treat nature as something that is not just out there it is something that is a part of our world. And Leviticus has all kinds of laws about the land and how to treat the land and how to conserve the land and the plants and, the, and all the crops and all the animals so that you don't overwork them, so that you don't overuse them. God is concerned about how we treat our environment, how we relate to God's creation, what we do with nature. And we know that when we are more in sync with our environment and with creation, with the, envi- with the nature, we thrive. Our lives are better. Leviticus has all kinds of laws and regulations about exploiting other people, about how not to do that, about creating more justice, about avoiding oppression. And when you look at some of these laws, they actually, once again, they look kind of repressive to us. They were innovative for the day. And we continue to innovate upon them. When we look at what has happened in just the past 150 years in our own nation, we are looking to evolve and develop. You go back into the 1800s all the way even until now with racism. And somewhere along the lines we begin to realize, hey, maybe all people are created by God. Maybe all people are meant to be equal. And we freed, we freed slaves. We outlawed slavery. We began to provide rights. And we continue that journey even today because more work needs to be done. Shortly thereafter, we begin to realize, oh, wait a minute, maybe, maybe that doesn't just apply to men. Maybe women are equal too. Maybe, maybe, oh, maybe we're all made in God's image. How about that? And we continue to develop on that today and more work needs to be done. And even right now, we are working for more rights and equity and ending oppression for our gay and lesbian brothers and sisters. That even this week have seen so many legislators around the United States trying to create repressive laws. And more work needs to be done. Leviticus gives us a window that says, hey, exploitation and oppression and injustice and discrimination needs to end. And we need to create a better society. We need to evolve. And finally, all kinds of laws around accountability and responsibility. That I'm not just here for me. I am responsible for you and you are responsible for me. I am concerned and must be concerned about your welfare, and you must be concerned about mine. We are all in this together, even if the other person doesn't even realize that. And you can imagine that over the past decade, even here in our country, that if financial leaders and government leaders had recognized this accountability and responsibility, that we would not have been in some of the economic and financial messes that we've encountered, that has set our society and our culture back. 
if we heed these principles that come out of the book of Leviticus. And so we sum them up, right? I mean, as these laws, I mean, Leviticus is really centered around don't do this and don't do that. And we begin to realize, you know what, let's sum those up. Because that allows this greater principle to rise out of them. And that greater principle has flown through all different societies and all the world's religions. And that first concept is do no harm. The Hippocratic Oath that all medical workers take. Do no harm. If in your life, your first motto was, do no harm, imagine how your life increases and expands. Imagine the amount of bad stuff that you create in your life all the time that would end because your first motto, your first principle of life is to do no harm. And then second, do good. How about I not just not harm you, but I go beyond that and say, what good thing can I do for you, or for you, or for you, for you, or for you, or for you, or for you? What good thing can I do at this moment for you? And ultimately, this gets summed up with the word love. The two greatest commandments, Jesus said, Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. Love. Love is something that is, has to be put into action. It is a tangible thing. You know when you are being loved. You can see it. You can feel it. It is something that literally smashes into you and you go, I am being loved at this moment. Love is not a concept. It's not an abstract thing. It is something that is real and alive and active in the world. Who do you need to love? How can you love yourself more? How can you love your neighbor and your family more? How can you love God more? How can you love creation more? These are the relationships that we have in our lives. Do no harm. Do good. Love. With all of those arenas of our lives. What if the next step in human evolution is a spiritual one? What if for us to expand and evolve, literally on the DNA scale of humanity, is a spiritual step? is a conscious step that we expand our very beings beyond the material world, beyond the animal world, and we become something greater. What if you do that in your life? What if you choose today to say, I am going to evolve and expand and increase, become something more, that I am going to take these principles of love and doing no harm and doing good and go out into the world this week and this year and do that in people's lives. What happens when we choose to do that? What happens when we choose to embrace love and hope and faith and compassion and mercy and goodness and patience, perseverance? What happens when we embrace openness and tolerance and inclusion what happens when we embrace people who are different than us? What happens when you decide that I am going to evolve? So this morning, I literally want you to think right now. How do I need to evolve? Who is a person in your life right now that you need to love? That you need to expand your capacity to do good in their lives? and to not do harm? What is something that you need to open yourself up to in life? Something that you've been avoiding? Something that scares you? Something that would stretch you and make you grow? What is something that you can do in creation, in nature, in the environment that will create a better rhythm for you 
that will create a healthier lifestyle for you. That will allow you to be more creative and have more energy and have more focus and to be there for yourself and other people more. These are the questions that help us to evolve. So are you evolving? Will you evolve? Let's pray. God, we know that you work in our lives, but often we don't think about what you're doing to our DNA, both physically and spiritually. We don't think about your power and light and energy flowing through our bodies and think about our rhythms each day and how we spend our time and how that might make us happier people, healthier people, and more whole. May we be these kind of holy people May we be these kind of people that expand and increase and grow, that take our evolution seriously, that release these big bangs into our lives in this world. God, we know that in Jesus Christ, this is how he thought. This is how he lived. Every day expanding, every day evolving, becoming something more and more. God, may we model our lives in that way. All along, you've been teaching us a prayer that tells us that heaven does collide in the earth, that the spiritual enters the material world, that faith changes our bodies and our minds. And so we open that prayer up now, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.